Hey man, just a quick note for you. Uh, this is an episode in which we discuss some stuff that might be a little bit sensitive. So if you like to listen to this out loud or listen to it in the car as you drive or with the family around, we love that. That's fantastic. This might be an episode that you want to screen a little bit first. It doesn't go too far into the weeds, but we bring up a few terms and some ideas that you're not maybe ready for the whole family to hear yet. So just be warned and do that as you see fit for your family. Welcome to the Iron Centurion Podcast, Christ-centered adventure into leadership, manliness, and brotherhood. I'm Michael DeGroat, and I enjoy outdoor adventure, backpacking, hiking, camping. In fact, I kayaked the Mississippi River from Illinois to the Gulf of Mexico. You can hear about that in our episode three, my adventure story. And hi, my name is Tim Storm. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Iron Centurion, and one of my passions is helping men find that intersection of discipleship and leadership and where that kind of intersects in scripture and what that means applicably to our lives. So that's one of the reasons why we started Iron Centurion. And Michael, that's actually one of the reasons why we're talking about this topic tonight. Uh, if you saw the title, hopefully that wasn't a bit of clickbait uh, that, that wasn't intended to be the case. Uh, but this topic of is online church, is it porn? Is it, is it essentially the same thing? And we're going to get into the, the specifics of that here in a bit. Yeah, because um, Tim, I'm super nervous about this because I I don't think I agree with you. <laughs> and that's, I think that's going to be the interesting part of this episode is that we can have a, a grown-up conversation about some things that are maybe a little bit outside of what we've talked about in the past, um, but will hopefully be a beneficial and, and building conversation uh, between the two of us. So without any further ado, uh, hopefully you at least saw the title before you clicked on it uh, in the car with your kids. And if that's not the case, now might be a good time to uh, put us on headphones or something else as you're driving down the road. Uh, Cause we might get into a few topics that might be a little bit sensitive uh, for the younger ones around. Uh, so yeah, that will let we'll you take that at, at your own risk. I'd be thrilled if you're listening with your family, though, in general, maybe not this episode, but any of our episodes, that'd be cool if you're listening on speakerphone and uh, letting other people participate using on the road trips. That's excellent. All right, Tim. So what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is an idea that I, I had, I don't know, probably a week or two ago. So it's kind of off the cuff, probably not fully fleshed out and developed, but that's kind of what I want to talk to you about, because I think that there is some merit here to this concept um, that that online church is destroying the church. Um, and I, I've got a, a couple goals, I think, for this episode, one of them being for us and for general church mem members and attenders, um, for us to critically think about our role and our interaction with online church. For, for pastors and church leaders, uh, for you, we'd, we'd hope that this would spur a conversation maybe as a staff, maybe internally on is, is online church, is this offering that we've kind of embraced at face value, is it actually harmful to the church body um, in the long term and even in the short term? So just keep those things in the back of your mind. Like we're really wanting to spur on a, a conversation here uh, about these topics. So Michael, let's jump into, or you were going to say something, weren't you? I was just going to say, so what are the, like... What are the what are the dangers or the harms you see? Well, let's let's start with how we got here in the first place, right? I think obviously everyone has the strong recent memories of where online church has really taken a surge. Obviously, it's not a new thing. A lot of churches were offering some sort of online uh, format, whether that was you know MP3s back in the day or whether that's you know with the the influx of things like YouTube and, and other streaming services, um, allowing churches to, to broadcast their sermons. So it wasn't really a new thing. But then 2020 came around, obviously, and uh, it exploded because churches weren't happening in person anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, and a lot of people, that was their only option was to attend some sort of online service. And for a year, year and a half, however long, you know, for what the situation was for where you were living. Ours was probably closer to eight or nine months here in, in North Texas, but um, 
yeah, we got, we got comfortable with this idea of going to church online. Maybe not comfortable, maybe not is the right word, but we got used to it for sure. Right. Sure. Uh, yeah. There was a significant surge in that. And, um, but I mean, 20 something years ago, I was running sound for a church on Sunday mornings and helping record the sermon on cassette tapes and then making duplicates so that people could have records. They could come and take them. They could take them to people who weren't there at church on Sunday. Uh, I mean, that's, that's not online church, but that, you know, I remember when we were dis discussing, should we move from cassette tapes to CDs? That tells you how old that technology is. It's been around for a long time, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, certainly online church with the production value it has today, like my church is a, a large church in Dallas and has had an online option for a long time. And then in 2020 uh, moved, you know, even heavier into that and production value went up and it became more uh, intended to be interactive because for a while it was the sole option. Um, so yeah, I, I certainly get that it's increased, but it's not, it's not new if, if, as far as the like connect to it differently later. Right. Right. So, I mean, even back when you're recording cassette tapes, you know, the, the, I think the target audience of that is, you know, somebody who is on a, a business trip or vacation potentially that Sunday, and they like to get caught up on what the church was talking about while they were out. And this wasn't, I don't imagine you'd have people coming in every week to the church and saying, Hey, can I get a cassette, you know, for months on end, you know, of, that's, that's generally true. I think there were, um, as I remember, there was one or two people who would come up cause, uh, cause I would copy them. We had this fancy technology that would make duplicate cassettes like four at a time really fast so as soon as the sermon was over within five minutes or so i could have four or eight copies already uh which was kind of cool um at least at the time but yeah there was a couple people maybe one who would come regularly to get it for somebody who was physically unable to come to church and so they would pick up a cassette to take home to them okay and i think we see that still today um i mean but and I, let's just be clear, or clear here in the beginning, like, I don't have any issues with you listening to, you know, sermons from, from churches. Um, you know, I, I have a few pastors online that I, I enjoy listening to their sermons that they broadcast, and Alistair Begg being one of those that I primarily listen to. Um, but that's not to say, like, I don't, I'm not mistaking myself as a member of Alistair Begg's church, right? So I think there's a difference when we start talking about are we talking about our local church body that we're now substituting in some sort of online format, or are we talking about something that I'm listening to in addition uh, to sitting under the leadership of a local church body? Does that, does that make sense? Is that fair yeah, delineation I, there? Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm following with you. And I also think now I'm starting to think that I might, we'll see, but I might disagree with you less and less. The more you're, the more you're talking, the more, uh, less, uh, my hackles are going down just a little bit. <laughs> okay, well, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so let's how let's do we talk so about how do we get here? Right, we yeah. talked about a little bit of how we got here. So what now? Yeah, well, let's, let's back up a step and talk about definitions too. What what is church? What is the church? So when we talk about that. Let's. So we're all on the same page at least with this conversation. Michael, how would you? What would you say to somebody who's a new believer or? maybe just doesn't have a, a clear doctrinal definition of what does it mean when we talk about the church? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a good question. I'll answer it. I'll also say we talked a lot about this in an entire episode. Episode six was how to go to church. And we talked about that a little bit. We had a pastor uh, join us to talk about how he would hope people would engage and prepare for coming to church on a Sunday. Um, right, just that intentionality and that mindset behind yeah. just not being a, a bench warmer right. in a literal sense. Exactly. But I think ultimately church is a place where believers can come together relationally, socially for the purposes of joint fellowship, joint worship of God, joint learning, joint edification and enhancement of their, of their skills as believers. So those would be the things I think would be essential to a church experience. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, from a definition standpoint, there's, there's two, two levels that we're looking at here. One is the big C church. Uh, that is every believer that is in Christ. That is a part of the body of Christ is the church, both modern and past. 
that it that encompasses the church. Um, and, and a lot of times you'll see this and referred to in writings as the the Catholic Church, not in terms of the dom- you know, denomination, the Catholic Church, but the universal Catholic Church, uh, meaning the Big C Church. That's a big doctrinal, you know, yeah, thing that gets it's in the around. it's in the Apostles' Creed, and I know that uh, occasionally various churches will put some or all of the apostles creed up on screen and have the church say it together different yep. denominations maybe do it more often but often there'll be a disclaimer ahead of time that hey in here it says the holy catholic church that we you know support or part of it and people are like well i'm Beth, i'm that baptist what are you talking about um it, it it's the big c catholic meaning uh something a little bit different at the time the creed was written than it made it to us today but it just means the body of believers around the world and then the second level being the local church, right? And that is where that is where you you're a, a member. That is where you sit under instruction. You know, all those things, Michael, that you were just referencing, that that's happening at the local level um, of a local body of believers. And I think that's really more the church. When we talk about the church uh, that we're talking about, we're not talking just about you you watching a service, you watching a Sunday morning experience. Like that's not when we when we're talking about the church, let's just be careful there. And and when we say mm. service and church, those are two different things. Well, and that's so when you when you said I occasionally watch sermons or teachings from Alistair Begg, but I don't consider him my pastor. That I'm a member of his church, even though we're all jointly members of the church. Right. Not the physical same local body, but the capital C Church of Christian Christianity, um, part of all Christendom but you're not part of his local gathering. Right. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we good on, good on this so far. Yeah. So, okay. So walking through this episode, then we're going to use, we're going to mostly then be talking about the, that local church experience moving forward. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Good. So since we're on the topic of definitions, let's go ahead and, and jump into what porn is. Right. And I'm not, trying to be condescending here because obviously this is a a serious issue that a lot of men deal with. I mean, if you just look at it from a statistical standpoint, um, but how does that, how does that relate to online church services, online church um, as we are seeing today? Well, at its core, what porn is, is self-centered consumerism, right? You see something online in a magazine, in the various other forms that it comes in, and it's all about you. It's all about how you can take something uh, that doesn't belong to you and use it for yourself. Uh, it's a counterfeit version of something holy and sacred, right? So it, it's taking something that God has ordained as good and holy and, and righteous when it's in the proper context. And it, it takes it outside of that context. And it's no longer about a relationship. It's no longer about you and your spouse. It's about you and some random person on the internet. Um, and because of that, it, it's devastating, right? It's sex stripped of relationship. You can choose when you watch it, where you watch it, what you're watching. Uh, you know, and it, a lot of that was what got me thinking about this is pretty similar to the ways that online church, I think is becoming a new normal in our society. And I wanted to just kind of like have a conversation that pumps the brakes on what that really looks like. Mm. I see. I, um, I, <laughs> I was humorously reminded as you were talking about definitions, there's a famous uh, court justice in the U.S. was talking about freedom of speech and First Amendment rights and what's obscene and not. And he had a hard time putting a definition on pornography. Uh, he basically said, I'm really not sure I'm going to be able to define it, but I know it when I see it, uh, which has been one of those things that has been somewhat humorous but is kind of this definition of like that can be something difficult to to nail down but i see what you're getting at here where you're talking about kind of that one-way consumerism uh devoid of true relationship self-focused um not fully um mutually participatory um i i I see what you're talking about here okay but um flesh out for me how that relates to how does that relate to online church so i think a lot of those same things really fit in 
you know, when you are start talking or start talking about online church, um, a, a church body is a holy and a sacred thing. A gathering of believers to worship on a Sunday morning is a holy and a sacred thing, right? And when you all of a sudden say, you know, I'd rather sleep in this morning. I and you know, my kids have a soccer game planned for this afternoon and church is going to get in the way of that. Um, we'll just watch it online. Um, that's when you start to say, I want to take this thing that I really should be at. I should be participating in. I should be active and present in, and I'm going to do it on my own terms. Uh, I'm going to extract myself. Uh, we're going to do it in our, our living room at the house. Might be surfing our phones that we wouldn't be doing while we're actually sitting there in a pew, um, but we're not going to be paying the attention to that we would be typically. And even if you are, just this concept of what you've done is you've removed yourself from the, the physical gathering of the body of Christ and are essentially trying to replicate that experience by yourself on your couch. Interesting. You know, so one of the reasons I was nervous about this concept, and you're touching on it here, is I was nervous about the idea of taking something that is sacred, something that is holy, the church experience, and equating it with something that is sinful in all cases. So online church, as compared to pornography, we're taking something good, comparing it to something sinful. It's a pretty significant stretch of a of a metaphor or a um, but I see, I see where you're going from with the ability to just not belong anywhere, but take church in church in, I'm putting air quotes here, but to take church in on your schedule at your time, at your convenience comes with some downsides. And to be clear, I, I hope that if you've listened to other episodes of ours, like we, we aren't the kind of like hard charger. You've got to be in a pew every Sunday morning type of, you know, we understand like I miss church from time to time on business trips or going on a family vacation, those types of things. Um, so heathen, we're not approaching sinner, heathen, <laughs> <laughs> even some Iron Centurion events go through a Sunday morning. So That's true. Actually, uh, I missed church last, the most recent Easter. I wasn't at church for the first time in a long time that I missed an Easter, actually maybe the only time. And it felt really weird, but I was um, traveling through customs to get to a place where I was going to be doing some gospel focused teaching and work. But I was, I spent Easter morning working with international customs. It's weird. That felt weird. <laughs> it did feel, it was the weirdest Easter Sunday I've spent in a while. Yeah. yeah. So we're not, we're, I really don't want to come at this from a legalistic standpoint. And the other thing, too, I want to bring up is that there probably are some legitimate special circumstances that would warrant this being a, a good and useful tool. Um, Michael, I, I know online church has been a, a necessary part of your family's story. Uh, yeah, my wife um, still is a little bit less so, but was literally allergic to church. Um, and I, I, very real, literally allergic to church for a while. Going in person was... Um, impossible or extremely costly. Uh, for a while, we were going 20 to 30 minutes late on purpose, sitting in a special section that was actually in a separate room, and it was just on screen, um, which felt a lot like online church because it was a small room, like overflow seating. Uh, and then we had to leave early, right before everyone was dismissed. Um, her health issues caused the physical place uh, and not just that building, like it's not like we could switch to a different church, but the, the, the noise, the volume, the experience in the church was very costly and um, painful for her and, and triggered some significant medical issues. So we couldn't go traditionally to church for a while. And so we did the whole sit in the overflow and watch it on screen, even though it's happening in the room next to us for a while. And then that quickly starts to feel like online church. Um, and even it got to a point where just the, the ability to get in a vehicle and go physically was significantly taxing and demanding for her. So much so that if we did anything, basically from if we did anything after Thursday, um, it eliminated the ability for her to feel strong enough to make Sunday happen. And so for a while, we just didn't do anything on the weekends so that we could do church and make that a priority. Uh, but that was hard. 
Uh, and there were times when things had to happen, birthdays or something, or we had to celebrate something or go to somebody's thing for a dinner, and it would just wipe her out so much that we couldn't do church. So for a, for a season, and we're still in that season some, um, online church is the easiest solution. And I use that word easy, knowing that that's one of the concerns you have about online church. Um, but also saying that I think this is one of the areas I was planning to disagree with you a bit about is I think there's some legitimate special circumstances um, where church can't be easily or well or meaningfully experienced the way it was designed to be experienced. Yeah. And this is where I just want to completely reiterate, like, that this is a this is an issue that every man is going to have to take up for his own family, right? Of how does how does this fit with our situation, with our scenario? And the goal here being, as you evaluate it, are you are you doing this purely out of desire for comfort, out of desire for a cleaner and neater schedule uh, that church is not getting in the way of, um, or would you have what I would consider to be more legitimate reasons, which would be, you know, some like in your case, Michael, some significant health issues that your wife has gone through in the last several years. Um, yep. This is year five. Yeah. Yeah. And I think back to making copies of tapes, you know, one of those people who was getting tapes was to take it to somebody who was pretty much bedridden medically. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think, I think that's an example of, because initially I thought you might be coming at this from the approach that online church is bad because technology is bad and then i realized no you you're, you're not that's not you um but at the same time there are those i do know people who say technology is bad and we should avoid it altogether um they're probably not listening to this podcast so i could probably name them if i wanted to <laughs> <laughs> but right that they just say all technology is bad and i say no technology does can do some really good things if we interact with it well we can use technology to have conversations and connect with people in ways we never have been able to before but it can be used for bad just like it can be used for good well and, and that even that line there reminds me of what we were saying about facebook and like 2004 2005 when it was first coming onto the scene you know people i mean you and i were showing up to college at that point like hey all these new people i'm just meeting i can make friends with them and then a few years later oh we can post pictures of things that we're doing and this this uh early days of social media that we were all like this is so great all these new people that i'm meeting i can i can start to kind of get a better picture of their lives and what their, who their family is and the vacation that they just went on and this is so great, right? Because it's giving me this kind of behind the scenes look into what their life is like. And we all kind of flock to this idea of this is, this is wonderful. Yeah. Well, fast forward, and here we are, you know, many, many years past that. And you're starting to see even the younger generation, their statistics out. And this was some of the numbers I was looking at today. Um, most of the studies were done pre COVID. So I, I wasn't seeing any post COVID numbers on this. But even the the Generation Z is that the is that the one under us? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, but they're saying thirty four percent of them are leaving social media permanently, never to come back, because they even at, at their young ages are understanding like that this is completely detrimental to their mental health, to uh, yeah. to their real relationships with people. But I think not just Gen Zers, but I think the older millennials and and beyond are also realizing this as well. And, and there's this kind of walking away from social media. Um, I don't think we'll ever fully get rid of it because we kind of created a monster, you know, billion dollar industries that came up just because we wanted to be more socially connected. I feel like that conversation happened in a completely separate silo as the online church has happened. And we're not looking at the two parallels and saying, is this really a good thing? Is it the best thing that we should be offering to our church congregations? Um, and should we be offering it that freely to people when, yes, technology is allowing us to do some incredible things and we can stream live services to uh, you know, people in China who may not have access to a church. Um, but for 99% of the church congregants, is it the best option? You know, because a lot of churches, I mean, especially larger churches at this point, we're not just talking about a service online. We're talking about 
a lot of the offerings that they have in terms of adult education are now being offered online, uh, whether those are, you know, sort of Bible studies or, uh, you know, different, different groups where people are addressing sin issues, those types of things are having some sort of online component because people have gotten used to, oh, I can go to the service online. How come I can't do the other church offerings online as well? So I think we've seen a lot of that, you know, you know being offered in, a, in an online setting. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm still going to say, I think sometimes that can be good and sometimes it can be bad. I don't want to necessarily be a Facebook apologist here, but I can say that I have developed, enhanced, and even met people via Facebook that I would not have built relationships with, right? I can list names of men who've been encouraging and meaningful in my life. Uh, I think of William and Ethan and Warner and Lucas and Jim. These are guys that I would not have met would, had it not been for Facebook, and they've been meaningful in my walk with the Lord. And yet at the same time, social media has done a tremendously large amount of damage uh, to our ways of interacting on the global scale. So yeah, I think I come down on technology as that technology is mostly neutral. It is how you choose to engage with it that either honors God or doesn't. And sometimes those consequences can take a while to see. So I, I do like your parallel of saying we've kind of run those two things in separate silos. I, I can see, I can agree with you and see the, the potential future risk down the road of if we push really hard as a culture of making church a purely on-demand digital experience. That's, that's, not, that's not healthy. There are some significant negatives there. I mean, I'm just thinking back to a time, I mean, it was uh, spring of 2020 when I was leading a group of men through a kind of a 12-step recovery program from a gospel-centered focus um, that our church offers. Um, and it was right around the time the pandemic hit. So half of the group happened pre-lockdown, and then the final half of the group happened after lockdown. Um, so the group moved from in-person meetings to completely virtual Zoom meetings, and it was terrible uh, because the guys weren't opening up like they were in person. It was like every, all that work that we'd done to connect the guys and have good conversation and meaningful conversation. And the guys are being invested in their work seemed to just kind of be disappeared at the drop of a hat um, as we moved to an online setting because the, the stakes weren't as high, right? Because I, I couldn't look you in the eye and know if you're really telling me the truth because I'm looking at you in a virtual setting. And that's if your, your, uh, your video window is even open. Uh, and not glitching at the wrong moment at some right. right yeah i um yeah i could that's an interesting fascinating side by side comparison that you got to kind of do that on both halves of the digital world uh and be able to starkly see the contrast yeah it got to the point where i, I told my leadership at the church i was like i will not help lead a course again if if it stays in this type of format because it was worthless um, wow i was going to ask how it ended so you're saying that the ending did not have the result that you expected no. or wanted. no it wasn't the first time i've been a part of a group like that um yeah. and and helped out in the leadership side of things as well and it, it was just completely different than all the in-person and i think the church even recognized that and said yeah this is not a good way to to do this type of of teaching well church is ultimately a relational the the ministry side of church is a relational ministry and it's hard to do relational ministry in a yeah. digital sterile environment i agree all right, so so your concerns are that uh, it it feeds into perhaps our natural proclivities to silo away, to to hide from each other and from God, um, and doesn't bring people together where they can have authentic, real relationships. It allows us to have the fake, posed relationships, just like people who post on Facebook the one or two curated photos from their vacation. Uh, right. Right. Which is fine. Of course they should. But then we all interpret that as like, that's what their life is like all every day. Right. Yeah. It's easy enough just attending a church, right? You can, you can still hide in a, in a church and not fully engage, but it's so much even easier when you're not even seeing another physical human being sitting next to you. Um, I'm reminded of the passage where, where Paul's writing in first Corinthians, 20 about the idea that the church, I mean, he's, he's 
comparing the church to a physical body, right? Um, the, the comparisons of people being ears and eyes, and, and we all have a special role within the body to play that God specifically designed us for. And this, this concept of American individualism, I think, takes a nasty route here where mm. we don't necessarily see church as a two-way street. Um, and what I mean by that is that you need the church and the church needs you because you have something, Michael, I mean, you have a lot of wonderful talents that, that your local church body has greatly benefited from because you're such a great speaker. You have, you know, great wisdom when it comes to teaching. Um, you're kind of compassionate to the other people that are around you. This is a, a part of Christ's heart that is reflected specifically in you that the church needs to have. But at the same time, the local church body also has impacted you and your, your uh, relationship with your wife and all these other aspects of your family. Like you've needed the church. And it's the same exact thing for me as well. And I can point to numerous times over my, at least, you know, the 12 years of marriage that we've had so far where the church was pivotal at coming in at special times in our marriage and helping us course correct and helping us uh, helping us to grow and helping us to pursue Christ in ways that only the church body can. What that's required of us is that we've been invested in that local church community. And I'm just concerned that with this advent of online church, where you can take it as a consumer and do it on your own terms, that it completely just the same way that porn is a counterfeit version of sex, that online church is a counterfeit version of an actual church. Well, you know, first, thank you for your, <laughs> your compliments. Um, uh, that's, that's kind, but I do resonate really strongly with actually what you just said about it being a two way street. Uh, and I was thinking about two things. One, a pastor that I spoke with who was doing online church during the uh, height of the pandemic. So that was the only offering that their church was being able to make happen. They had decided to move only online. And he, he was expressing to me how difficult it was preaching when he is by himself on a stage in a room and there's no energy, there's no audience to feed off of. There's nobody laughing when he tells a joke. He's staring into the cold lens of a camera. Uh, and when his eyes wander, he's not wandering across audiences, but empty chairs. And he said, that's so hard. And I think that made me realize, not just in that moment that it's hard, but that's hard on every Sunday. And sometimes my job in the congregation is to make a smiling eye contact face back so that when he looks out from the pulpit, he has encouragement to keep going with what he's saying. And that he didn't have that during uh, the online only environment. And that if I'm then not there at church and I'm instead online, he doesn't know that I'm online and can't see that I'm there. And that, that has an impact. And I also think about um, 1 Peter 4. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. I wanted to briefly, let me just briefly read this passage because I think this fits really well. Peter is talking about people who have various gifts, spiritual gifts, gifts from God to use. And he says, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Basically, he's saying you're supposed to steward the gift God has given you. The gift he gave you isn't actually for you. It's for other people, and you need to use it uh, as a steward of God's in order to benefit the lives of other people. And then Peter breaks down all spiritual gifts into two categories, basically gifts of service and gifts of speaking. So in verse 11, he says, if anyone speaks, which would include things like preaching and teaching and prophecy and those kind of things, he says, if anybody speaks, they should do as one who speaks the very words of God. And if anyone serves, which would be leadership and administration and those uh, hospitality gifts, um, if anyone serves, they should do it, do so with the strength that God provides. So then all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And so the idea is use these gifts because God didn't give them to you. He gave them to me for the purpose of those around me so that they will be edified and so that God will be glorified. And 
man, I can see that's how do I do that online, right? I, I, I can't turn to my neighbor and greet him. I can't serve well at my church if I'm just phoning it in. That's, um, that's a good point. So, I mean, let me just ask you this question. Um, and if it's too raw, you know, we can cut the audio and come back and re-record it. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, so when, when you and Melissa were going through that extremely difficult time, I mean, was, was there anything that you did to maintain kind of that physical connection with the body? Yeah, we were fortunate for most of that time, actually, <laughs> to be engaged in a good life group. Uh, our church does the life group kind of model. Uh, and so we would have a, most of the time, a weekly gathering that was in person. And sometimes she wasn't able to go to that, but eventually the life group changed location and began meeting at our house. And that made it much easier for her. And I felt a significant change when that happened. Um, so that became in some ways, one of the small services of church. And in fact, it actually became a kind of a, um, maybe in some ways, even a bit of a temporary subset of that local church body. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, which, I mean, we had a large church, right? It's very easy at my church. If you want to, to walk in on a Sunday and walk out and not say hello to anybody, you know, if you choose to, because there's a lot of people there. Uh, if you choose to go out and seek the people, you know, you can't, but there's a lot of faces that can be strangers faces or distant acquaintances kind of a thing, but not within a life group, right? It was a life group of 15 people or so. And so we knew everybody and you noticed when somebody was missing. And so that was, that was helpful and gave us a place where we could both use some of our gifts and services. That's cool. Yeah. I, I found an article. It was interesting. Um, written by the gospel coalition. We'll link it in the show notes here, but, uh, they, they've got a kind of a clickbaity title. It says, if you want an extraordinary marriage, just be an ordinary Christian. Um, and one of the things that they talk about in that is that regular church attendance has some statistically significant impacts on uh, the longevity of people's marriages. Just reading from it here, it says, by skipping church, people are missing out on something that can make their marriages better and stronger. This set of surveys shows that the first marriages among evangelicals who attended church only several times a year or less are about 20% more likely to end in divorce or legal separation than those who attend weekly or more. All right, that's, that, that's pretty significant. That is. And that's just talking about church attendance. That, that's not even going into some of these other things we're talking about. I'm actually, you know, investing and serving within a local church body. Which I, I think we said pretty clearly uh, in the episode six, when we talked about how to go to church, that's physically showing up is like the minimum bar level. And I, yeah. I know that for some people, they feel like that's the whole thing. And I'm, I would suggest that that's really just the ante. If you want to be in the game of connecting with people and doing church the way God wants you to physically showing up is like the smallest step you can make in that direction. And I don't want that to feel like a guilty burden upon people, but that that's not. Uh, a it's really an invitation, right? Because this is where yeah. depth is found. This is where true life and relationship is found inside the context of a local church body. I mean, it's like, it's like going to the movie theater, buying a ticket and then not going into the, into the theater and, and watching the movie. Right. It's like, you're, you're just yeah. kind of here and we're not really sure why if that's if that's all you're doing is sitting and warm up a few because the true experience is to be had in the context of relationship with the local church body the other people who are made to reflect the heart of jesus christ alongside with you yeah the really good stuff is just beyond i mean it's not a lot beyond even really you've done the work to get yourself and your family and all the kids or whoever in the car and to church. And I know that can be difficult and exhausting. You got the whole minivan there and everybody's there and you feel like, great, I'm finally just here. But I think you're, you've done almost all the work. You're just on the threshold of having it really be significantly life-giving and glorifying to God. Um, and so if you just stop physically, uh, you, you're just short of where it really starts to become significant through um, deeper engagement. Well, Michael, I think, I think those are some interesting points. Um, 
I'm glad we've had a chance to, to talk this through and I'm glad it, you, you confirmed that wasn't too wildly off base. We'll see what the comment section <laughs> in this uh, blows up to be later on. Um. <laughs> yeah. So I think you have, I think you have mostly won me over, uh, which I mean, I trusted you going into this. So I thought there was a chance that you would, but I had some significant reservations and I, I still have a few, I'm still not sure I'm comfortable using a metaphor of church and relating it to something that's not good and sinful, but I, I understand now the cold, sterile, self-indulging elements of it. And I, I am concerned. I truly am. I think that um, for a while, actually for years, I've been talking about nominal Christianity. I don't know if we've talked about it on the podcast, but you and I've had some conversations about it. Just yeah. those who are Christians in name only because they grew up in the U.S. and America is a quote unquote Christian nation and because their parents were Christian and because going to church on Sundays at least occasionally, was what they did. Tradition. Uh, tradition, right? And you go to Christmas, on, uh, go to church on Christmas and Easter, and it's just the thing you do, and it feels normal, and it's your behavior pattern. That's actually, I think, on some ways, you might say, that's great, look how many people are going to church. On the other, though, they were just showing up, and they didn't know why, and they didn't want to stick with it and do anything meaningful. And I think what we've seen is... Um, I think when we look back, it's too soon, but maybe we're just seeing the cusp of it. That's what you're talking about here. But I think when we look back at the history of the church in the U.S., I think not because of COVID, but because of some of the responses during the pandemic and the significant push to online church and a few other things, people who were just doing it because that's what they did and they have stopped, I think we're going to see and churches all across the country right now are generally seeing a significant decline in physical attendance. I think some of that's going to stick around because I think a lot of the nominal believers have said, you know what, why my, my patterns changed. And I don't like, why do I need to do that? I, I don't, I wasn't benefiting. They probably weren't. Uh, I wasn't serving anyone. They definitely weren't. If they're in that category, I'm not sure we're going to see them come back. So the church is going to be significantly smaller. And in fact, I think there's a good chance, Tim, that kids who are today under 10 are going to grow up in, Amer in an America that is kind of a post, you know, we've, we've said we are a Christian nation. I think we're going to grow up in a post-Christian nation. And I think the history books are going to say the pandemic was one of the final nails in the coffin lid of Christianity being the hip popular thing to do. Um, you know, you really can't even get elected in a big political office without saying you're a Christian. It hasn't happened yet, at least not in a very, very long time. Um, I don't know if it'll continue to be that way. I mean, you don't actually have to, have to be a Christian. You just got to say you are, right? In, right? in politics, I don't know if that's going to stick around much longer. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the questions I asked myself before going into this episode is, so what, right? So what does this have to do with the listeners um, of our podcast, the people who would be, you know, coming to us for, for guidance in, in some of these topics. But I think where it comes down to is we're challenging men to lead. We're challenging men to step up and take that role of responsibility and authority in the families uh, that they're in, in the relationships that they're in, um, just to influence the circles of people that they're around, right? And this is one of those big questions that as a man, we have to ask ourselves, what, what is our church attendance going to look like? What is it going to mean why? What's the why behind why we, why we do what we do? You know, is it, like you said, it, are we just attending church because it's what our family expects of us? Um, is it because it, you know, is part of our larger family history and tradition? Or is it because we, we know and have found that to be the true life-giving place for our souls and for the, the health and, and restoration of our families is in the walls of that church and, and with the body of believers that God has provided to us in that local church community. Um, so, yeah, my encouragement would just be think about those things. Um, if what we've said has challenged you, I hope that's a good thing. You know, if you're a church leader, uh, again, we ask, just have these conversations as a staff and, and talk about what are the implications and where does this go long term? And are we encouraging our people enough to turn off the TV and to come in back into the physical building and to be here in person um, as it, as it fits for them. Right. I mean, obviously, you know, we, we've talked about 
reasons why that might not be the case, like, like in your case, Michael, but um, you know, are, are we challenging our people enough to come back and, and be here with the body of Christ? Yeah. And so then I, I think we could build on that too and say, if you're listening to this episode right now, this might mean that you need to go back to church, like make the commitment, set the alarm clocks, get the family up and go to church. Uh, but not just to warm up a pew, go to be uh, engaged, go to find ways to use your gifts to serve. It also might mean that you need to find a, a different church because perhaps the church that you um, would consider the church you would go to isn't the right fit because you're not able to use your gifts or talents there. You're not able to be engaged. Uh, maybe their expectations of you and what you're able to do aren't the right fit. So maybe you need to find a, a different church. Uh, and you probably need to stop channel surfing churches on Sunday morning. Um, doesn't mean you don't use online sources to further your study and education. There's some great podcasts out there that'll help further your walk with Jesus. Um, one's way better than ours that you can find <laughs> and listen to. There are some great sermons and churches that are all online that you can watch, but I, it has been interesting to, to, to listen to people talking about how they, they realized, right, because of the pandemic that, hey, if I'm just watching it online, I don't have to watch my churches online uh, stuff. I can watch any churches. And so what has happened is some of the big celebrity pastor churches have seen massive increases on their online viewership. But there is no way that that pastor is able to engage in those people's lives and minister to them directly outside of his preaching and teaching. He can't know them. They can't go to his house for dinner. Uh, they can't be part of a life group there. Um, and so those are concerns. And they can't serve that body in a way that edifies them for the glory of God, as First Peter tells us to do. So, all right. So think out your church strategy. And, uh, and Tim, I don't disagree with you as much as I thought I might. Well, good. If you're looking for a way to get engaged with some other men, um, one of the things that Iron Centurion offers is a once weekly or once monthly, uh, excuse me, uh, meetup that we call Legion. And we do that in cities at the time of this recording uh, across Texas. Um, hopefully in the future that can be expanded to other cities, but check our website for more information on that. And it's a place where you can uh, go work out where we can teach you a, a cool tactical or wilderness survival type of skill. And then we'll spend some intentional time praying for one another as it relates to our leadership uh, in these types of environments, right? With our families, uh, in our churches, in our, in our places of work. Um, so it's a really neat type of uh, once a month environment where we get to spend some time with some men being intentional about the things that we like to do. So I would encourage you if, if you're wrestling with how to get, how to get plugged in with other men in a way that's not boring and uh i don't know what else would you say about that michael well i would first say in relation to this episode it is definitely not a replacement for church um, sure right yeah. uh, and it's not meant to be but it can feel like it because it has some of those elements because there is a place where you can be engaged in leadership and serve others uh, there's a place where there's fellowship and community and it is for the glory of god so it has some of those elements but it's not a replacement for church no and we'll um, tell you that on a saturday morning too it's like hey <laughs> We'll see you at the pews on Sunday morning, right? Absolutely. But it is a it is a great way to engage with some other believers in your city. Uh, maybe ones who don't go to your church. So it's fellowship across, kind of cross-pollinating through different churches. Uh, we, and I like that actually quite a lot. Uh, so it's a good way to find some community with other people. Well, thanks for joining us today on the Iron Centurion Podcast. We hope it's been beneficial for your hearing today. We are a Christ-centered adventure in leadership, manliness, and brotherhood. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you for listening to the Iron Centurion Podcast. We're thankful for the support of listeners like you who support this podcast through donations. If you'd like to be a part of our support team, check us out on patreon.com or ironcenturion.org. For more information on what it means to be a leader for Christ or how you can get involved, visit ironcenturion.org.